got love for you, man. You know what, I'm what are we talking about? You know, I'm not here to start any trouble. I'm only going to say nice things about you from now on. I think you're handsome, and I think you're a wonderful host. I'm fat and I'm overweight. Just don't say anything silly. I was waiting for you to say that. I'm not laughing about it. You think this is funny? I take it serious. You know, I don't want y'all to take anything out, out of context that I'm saying. He's very funny. He likes to joke around a lot. As a personality and as an entertainer, yes. This is going to be really quick. I'm not taking any questions. Go ahead and get comfortable. I'm going to talk for a little bit. You're listening to Cabbie Presents, the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Cabbie Richards. I appreciate the support. Thank you for the click. Thank you for the download. Thank you for the subscription. To chart my adventures. Ah, you you don't really need to know about my adventures. But if you are curious, on Twitter, it's at the real cabbie. On Instagram, it's at the real cabbie. On Vine, it's at the real cabbie. And you can see all my segments for those who are discovering this for the first time at tsn.ca slash cabbie presents. So it's Thanksgiving weekend this weekend. And a few years ago, I'd say maybe six years ago, I was having Thanksgiving dinner at my parents' house, which is they live in um, Brampton, Ontario, which is about 20, sorry, 40 minutes outside of Toronto in the suburbs. So my mom has like a penchant for coming up with interesting conversation. First, you know, everything is... Like every family, their 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 conversation is kind of small talk ish, on the surface. Like, hey, how's work? All that sort of thing. But my mom somehow veer the conversation into something very interesting. Like, it's it's either like it's uh you know a conversation about socioeconomics or about uh, politics or about minerals being you know farmed somewhere in the world. Like, my mom is a very intelligent person. Uh, my mom actually told me about the internet when I was in high school, when I was in the 11th grade. She said, there's a network of computers that they're calling the information superhighway. You should invest money in one of these companies that, that do this thing called the World Wide Web. And I'm like, mom, I'm 16 years old. I work at Beaver Lumber, I work at a hardware store and I make, I think, six bucks an hour. What, what am I going to invest in? Like, I, I have a job so that I can go to the movies on the weekend or play uh, laser tag or, um, you know, buy Mariah Carey CDs for my girlfriend at the time. Like, what am I going to invest in? What do you, like... So, in one particular conversation, before we got to the centerpiece of our thing, I asked my parents how they met. And I'm sure for most of you guys listening, you've had this conversation with either your mother or your father um, at some point. So I was curious. I mean, I was like a grown man at this point. Like I was probably 30. And excuse me. So I'm recalling the time when I asked my parents when they met. And I think I asked them when I was 16 or 17. And my mom said we met at the library at university. My parents went to uni the University of Toronto and the library there is called the Robards Library. So I was like, oh, okay, they met at the library, whatever. I accepted that as the truth. So then like six years ago at Thanksgiving dinner, I, you know, I started to do some digging. I'm like, well, what was school like for you guys in the 70s? And, you know, my dad was, you know, the, you know he was, he rolled with this crew, you know, that was a little more radical at the time. You know, there was... Before the free love movement, there was, you know, the late 60s, there was a lot of change in the, in the you know, the social climate of North America. I mean, the, the civil rights movement had, uh, you know, had taken place a decade earlier, and it was, you know, punctuated on t with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's untimely death in 1960, his assassination in 1968. You know, that, and that's, it, that's sort of, that lingered. So my dad's like, you know, I hung with, you know, it was more, more radical students and, you know, mom really liked that. And then my dad, I was like, well, dad, how did you support yourself when you were at school? My dad, he told me he was a DJ and he used to throw parties with his, uh, with his partner. I, and I've explained this on podcasts before, but if you hadn't heard it, here's the story. 
So my dad's, uh, and I'm, I'm going to get my dad on this podcast so he can tell, uh, talk about this era of time in, in Toronto where Yorkville, uh, for those who know about Toronto, Yorkville was, is, is a very affluent uh, area of town. There's like the, you know, the expensive boutique shops like the Louis Vuitton store, you know, the, you know, those, those kind of, um, the Chanel store, those kind of shops. So at that time in my dad's era, you know, Yorkville was like where the hippies used to hang out. It was really super bohemian the way that Kensington Market is right now. So he used to throw this party, these parties with his friend and his friend's handle was also a, a DJ he was known as Detroit Disco, and he did the funk. My dad was like, he used to play the baddest funk music and reggae. So my, you know, Detroit Disco, like, got the party, party hyped. He was turned up. Like, the party got turned up when he jumped on the tables. And then my dad was known as the Soul Defender. So he used to smooth out the parties for, I'm not sure how much time. I'm going to ask him specifics of how long each set was. But he would smooth it out with, like, the Commodores and Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin and, and James Brown, but like play the slow jam. So, you know, there'd probably be like one red light in the room and like if the room was probably dark and, and you know, my dad was out there and I remember the vinyl records in my house and they had like the, the gold label, sorry, the, the purple label. And then my dad would write in his, in his penmanship soul defender on the inside label. So my mom used to go to these parties. So I'm like, wait a second. I'm like 30 years old. I know how parties work. I know how much the DJ gets play. You guys didn't meet at the library. You guys met at a jam. So I urge you to do some digging at Thanksgiving with your family. And don't accept the first story as the real story. If, if the first story sounds too good to be true, meeting at the library. You guys were slow jamming, slow dancing, grinding to, boy, I don't even, like some Al Green or something like that. Donny Hathaway, some Stevie Wonder back in those days. My guest on the podcast, I will do some digging and you will be surprised what I unearth in this conversation with one of the scrappiest dudes in the NHL. He joins me on the phone right now. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. The first time I met this man, I was covering the 2009 NHL playoffs in Vancouver. It was the second round, and his team was facing the Chicago Blackhawks. It was probably late April, early May. In our first interview, he used the term frenemy, which I heard for the first time, then proceeded to rip it off as though I came up with it myself. He's a tough SOB, and at times, he scowls. But in our first encounter, I got him to smile. And if I read his mind correctly, he thought, who is this chubby idiot in a t-shirt asking me questions that have nothing to do with hockey? Years later, I called on him to stage an impromptu road hockey game during the NHL lockout on a court under a bridge in Vancouver. Three or four hundred people showed up after a couple of tweets from his teammate Ryan Kessler and my guest Kevin Bieksa. Always honest, always down for whatever, and I'm happy to be joined by Kevin Bieksa of the Vancouver Canucks. Thank you very much, sir. Hot, what's going on? Wow, what an intro. Yeah. That was I, phenomenal. I put some thought into these things, man. I'm not just a... Uh... Yeah, that, that feels good. You know, it's pretty accurate, too, with uh, what you thought I was thinking when I first met you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like uh I I don't even, you know, I don't even think I knew any better, but I just knew that I was doing things differently and you guys yeah, respond you're, you're definitely different. Well, yeah, but di like different good or different bad? Oh, they're different good. Uh I don't know about the, the the frenemy thing. I don't remember ever using the word frenemy. That's kind of embarrassing, no? No, no. Fre no, I still well, I know I still use frenemies. No, but it was like it was fresh to me at that time, frenemies. I think I was I think the bit was about um, if you would, if any of your your, your opponents would, um, if they tried to uh, um, be cordial with you, like during the series, would you be 
would you extend that that courtesy? And I think that was the bit. And then you you came up with, or you you said like, oh, like frenemies, like you're you're pretending to be. Fren- yeah, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that I know what that movie's from too. That's, that's from Mean Girls, I think. Is it? <laughs> Dude, Mean Girls is a great movie. Oh, embarrassing. I, well, okay, but no, seeing Mean Girls isn't as embarrassing as owning the Notebook on DVD. Do you? Well, actually, yeah, I do own that as well. Oh, yeah. my gosh, dude. That's in your home? Yeah, I could get it out the drawer right now. I haven't watched it in a while, though, if that's any consolation. No, it's no consolation. You own no. the movie, dude. Well, I obviously didn't buy it myself. I think my wife bought it, but uh, it's it's in my possession. <laughs> Well, because you are married, then you have a pass. If you're a single guy and you owned a cat and you had the notebook, so many strikes then on your I'd record. Do, then I'd be doomed. Yes. Hey, remember in that series, um, Sammy Sallow got hit in the jewels and, like, ru- ruptured a testicle? Yes, I do remember that. That wasn't fun at all. No, it didn't, didn't that dude, did he play the rest of the game or did he, like, come back in that series? No, he didn't go. He didn't play the rest of the game. He came back later in the series, but he missed a, a couple games, and I think he was at, like, three or four days until he got feeling in his voice back. <laughs> and part of his soul back. If if he's a 14 out of 10 in toughness, what are you? If, if he's, I think that's the most pain I've ever actually seen somebody in. And, and I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of injuries before, you know, puck shot at people. Well, that was Sammy as well, getting a puck shot at his face. I've seen guys break bones and everything, but I've never seen somebody in as much pain as he was when he got hit uh in the privates there. Um, but what, what's your, what was your bad question again? <laughs> <laughs> if Sammy Sallow is a 14 out of 10 in toughness, what are you? Uh, I don't know. I'll say I'll 8 or 9, a respectful 8 or 9. That, okay. that is respectful. That is respectful. Hey, uh, so I was, um, I, a couple, uh, earlier this week, um, the Colorado Avalanche played in Toronto. And then I messaged uh, Matt Duchesne, who plays for Colorado, after the game. I'm like, dude, how many tickets do you have to buy in Toronto? Because he's from the GTA, as are you. Uh, and he said 11. I was like, oh, man, that's like two, three Gs. Easy. That it's just coming out off your visa. And then I told him that when L.A. played in Winnipeg earlier in the season, uh, Mike Richards, who's from Kenora, which is two hours away from Winnipeg, he had to buy 23 tickets for his friends and families. His friends and families. So that's like, I don't know if it's a full game check, but like that's a significant amount of a game check or like a, a part of your, your, uh, your check there. Him. Not for him, though. <laughs> he's, he's got some big checks coming in, I think. I'm sure he does. Yeah, I'm sure they have like, they've like two or three commas. Uh, what's the most that you've had to buy? I think earlier in my career in Toronto, um, I can't remember exactly how many I bought, but I had I had to have had more than thirty people come to the game. Are you kidding? In Toronto? Well, yeah, that's where I kind of grew up. I know it's a Hamilton. You, it was Hamilton, right? Yeah, just outside of Hamilton. If you want to get specific here? <laughs> well, where, like where where outside of Hamilton? Grimsby. Like uh, where? Grim, a small town called Grimsby. Where I grew up. <laughs> Grimsby. <laughs> <laughs> You're I can laughing see, too. I can see Toronto over over the lake. <laughs> Grimsby. So thirty tick. That's a lot. And if that's early in your career, you're not making the kind of bank that you make now. So that's like significant, right? Yeah, that was coming right out of uh, the savings. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think I said that I would uh, I would buy everybody's first uh, first ticket to see me play, and then after that, they would kind of be on their own. But that didn't really hold up either. So are you still, do you guys play in Toronto this year? Do you guys make it out east? Play, yeah, there's this uh, new schedule that we came up with where you play every team uh, home and home at the least with every team. So we're, we're coming back to Toronto just before the Olympic break. Uh, nice. But we're going to Buffalo in a couple weeks, and Buffalo's even closer. It's only about 35, 40 minutes. So i got a, a big chunk of family coming out there. But now I'm at the point where I, I basically beg my family, if you want to come see me, I'll take care of it. Just come watch me play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just desperate for some fans right now. But uh, but in Buffalo, you can get tickets for like twelve bucks. So that that may yeah. that may not be too much, too bad. Yeah, like a hundred dollars, and I can buy like thirty six tickets. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. I'm like invite all your friends, bring whatever you want. Thirty is a lot, dude. I didn't think it was going to be that high. Like, ha- have you heard of something more? Like, have you heard of a guy buying more than thirty tickets in a particular building? 
I've heard of uh, in Detroit, Tesla always has a pretty big following, but he usually gets, I think, like 50 or 60 tickets, and he makes probably 95% of them COD. <laughs> <And they get, laughs> so he pays for like five of them, but he gets like 55 and, and makes everyone pay for their own. <laughs> <laughs> who, who physically collects the money? Does he physically collect that money? No, when you leave them COD, uh, they have to actually pay at the counter to get the tickets to show up, uh, show their ID, and then have to like physically pay there. Oh my the gosh, that's ID. amazing! I don't it's think a, I've ever heard that before. Move. It's a scumbag move. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of which, how was your fishing trip? My fishing trip was. Uh, I'm surprised you know about that, but that, it was amazing. It was. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm not a guy that goes on a lot of fishing trips. I've never been on a serious one like this before, but uh, I'm, I'm already looking forward to going back. I had so much fun. It was, it was a great trip. Are you kidding? You, you, like, you, you're being serious? I'm being dead serious. And, yeah, I mean, you, you would think, if you've never been on a, a fishing trip in, in the ocean at this resort, you would think, okay, what are you talking about? But uh, you couldn't, I couldn't get enough of it. We were on the water for, you know, 10 hours a day. And you couldn't get enough of it. It was it was that much fun. Why was it fun? Well, there's a number of reasons, <laughs> but uh, you know, just okay. Which ones can boat. you say on the radio? Uh, I, I've never really had the feeling of reeling in my own fish and, and bringing it onto the boat. We actually just cooked uh, one of the halibut tonight, so it's it's just a real manly feeling to be able to provide for your family and <laughs> catch your own food. Hey, what, what's the what's the proverb? Teach a Teach a man to fish, he can feed himself. What's the... I'm screwing it up. I don't know. Yeah, you don't know what you're talking about right now. Dude, I, but, you, know, uh, you know knowledge is not in my brain. Yeah, don't even try. But anyways, uh, it, it was it was a lot of fun. out. It was obviously very beautiful up there. You could see Alaska, the coast of Alaska. It was, uh, you know, you felt like it was very remote. Uh, it, I don't know. I can't tell tell you how good it was, but it was it was really good. So for the people who don't know what we're talking about, the Vancouver Canucks, what was it, a four-day team-building excursion, correct? Is it four days or five days? Yeah, it was like four or five days. Four or five days before the season started, new coach, a couple of new guys, a team-building uh, expedition. So how did, uh, who was the boat's DJ? Was that Garrison, or was there music on the boat? <laughs> the, the, there was only two, uh, we had small individual vessels so you had a guide and then you had two people per boat so um you know each boat had their own uh, music playing but we had the uh, the cb radio so we're you know going back and forth uh, making fun of each other and your boy kessler had the the music going over the cb once in a while you know very bad taste in music but... <laughs> what was he playing uh there was it was uh it was XM Radio, so he was, you know, he likes the hip. He thinks he knows the hip hop, so he was trying to play some of his hip hop. <laughs> sure, your boy Kanye was on there. But, uh, there's, there's a lot of different tastes of music uh, on our team, so it, it clashes uh, very often. How were the guys divided? You said the guys were in pairs. Yeah, the guys were in pairs. I think we, we ended up switching um, every day. Well, yeah, so I had somebody different every day. I don't know who who decided, but uh, you know, there were some bragging rights for for certain boats for sure. What do you mean for certain? Why were certain boats more? Uh, were they more luxurious than others, or had more horsepower? What was what was the deal with the boats? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised you want to talk about this that much, but I'll talk about this all day. Yeah. Well, and listen, this is this is part of like who's ever gonna know this stuff, or who's ever gonna see? I mean, nobody, right? Nobody is privileged enough to know this. We uh, we had a little derby where we uh, we kind of put uh, some some resources together and saw who could catch the biggest fish and had a little friendly competition with uh, within the team. So, so was it like a hundred bucks each? It was competitive. Let's not, we don't need to crunch numbers here. But, uh, <laughs> Dude, a hundred uh, bucks each. That's like two two G's. You're walking away with two G's. That's nice. So twenty five hundred. That's that's nice. Yeah, that's that's a good payday for sure for catching a fish, right? Yeah. So was it a daily? Was it a daily pot, or is it like a pot at the end of the trip? There was uh, there was one competition at the beginning, and then once that was over, we had so much fun that we uh, we had another little one too. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic ending where uh, our buddy Alex Edler had uh, fish on his hook within five minutes of the competition being over, and he uh, he fought it for about forty five fifty minutes. To, to reel it in and ended up coming in second, which was pretty nice. Oh, uh, so wait, so how like how heavy was his fish, Edlers? Do you remember? His, yeah, his fish was just under thirty-five pounds. Wow, that's a big fish, man. 
so he fought that thing for about 45, 50 minutes, and there was a 1,000-pound sea lion that was trying to uh, eat the fish. On the Come line. on! So we had all the other boats kind of boxing out the sea lion to help him out there. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you guys didn't have, like, a paintball gun or, like, a, well, I can't, not a BB gun because that's yeah, a little no, cruel, but. That's, illegal, that's illegal. Okay, fine. Nonsense. <laughs> okay, so who won? Who had the biggest fish? Who's the who's the I big hate, cheese on the team? I hate I hate to say it. Like I hate to say this, but uh, it was uh, Cass. <laughs> the American. He was uh, yeah. He was pretty happy about it. Got <laughs> and he's not a guy who's like a, a humble winner, is he? He's not somebody you want to win at all. So he's been <laughs> about that all year. How heavy was his? His was uh, I think it was thirty six. So it was, it was pretty close. Did anybody fall in the water? Uh, nobody fell in the water. We jumped in the one day, five of us, but uh, nobody fell in. No, was and, anybody pushed in or thrown in? No, 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 no. We're all adults here. Yeah, but still, <laughs> you still, yeah, yeah. You're all adults in the game that you play, but not the way that you behave off the ice no, sometimes. We're not, we're not a bunch of hooligans that were crashing into each other and trying to throw each other into the water. It was, uh, there was enough fun going on that we didn't have to dump each other. So um, I know that uh, you have uh, two little angels. Do you are kids like too soft these days? And by that I mean like, you know, it feels like everybody's got a peanut allergy. It feels like you know you can't celebrate Halloween. There's some schools where you can't. They're not celebrating Halloween this year. Some school, yeah. you know, when kids play sports, you know, there are some leagues where they don't keep like there's not no wins or losses, or they don't keep score. They just want to have. Just the kids to have fun. Are are your kids old enough to play sports? And do you think kids are too soft these days? Yeah, well, that's that's a tough answer. It's pretty a controversial subject, but uh, well, let's get into it, Kev. Well, yeah, my kids are involved in sports, and they have uh, played in leagues where they don't keep score. And uh, I don't know how I feel, but uh, yeah, sometimes you wanna you wanna know what the score is it's just for for progress to see how you know how good they're doing, but. I understand the concept of it, and I think it is good. You want to keep the kids uh, interested as long as you can, and sometimes when you you keep score and, and you make it competitive at a young age, the ones that aren't, aren't as good kind of fall off the map and don't get to, to keep playing the game they love and get better. So Yeah, but that's uh, when they go into house that. league. That's when they, that's what house league's for. Yeah, but you know what? I'm 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 a late bloomer myself, so I can I can understand that. There's there's a lot of kids out there that maybe don't start uh, skating or start soccer, or basketball as young as some of these other kids, so they're a little bit behind at first. But um, you know, everyone knows the important years are when you you get into high school and just after that. So if you keep them in the game and allow them to develop, it, it makes you know it makes sense in the end. When you said you're a late bloomer, does that mean you didn't kiss a girl till you were like twenty, twenty one years old, twenty two? I kissed my wife when I was 20. <laughs> the first and only girl. First and only. <laughs> I'm surprised. Why are you laughing? I'm surprised you keep, you kept a straight face on that one. Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> Were you uh, so um, when you hold, hold on a second? This is such a long interview. I gotta take a bite of my sandwich. Go <laughs> ahead. Okay, fine. I'll go on a little. Hey, were you um in high school? Were you the valedictorian or the prom king or on student council? I love talking about high school. High school, just everybody can relate to it. And in Grimsby, Ontario, I'm I can't imagine you had that many kids at your high school. I'm thinking maybe forty to sixty total, from nine you know to what? OAC or nine to grade thirteen for those people who are not uh, are not from Ontario. You're trying to make a joke right now, but you're actually pretty close to the truth. I, I was the second class ever at, at my high school. Uh, it was Catholic high school that opened. So my first year, yeah, there was only 60 kids in the school. Uh, <laughs> I think 30, just under 30 in my graduating class. So I was a little bit of everything there. See, see what I'm like. Listen, I'm not just I'm not just a, a pretty face. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. There you go. Um, so. Does that okay? So with like thirty kids in your graduating uh, high school class, uh, were you the valedictorian? No, I was not the valedictorian. Well, once again, I was a late bloomer. So <laughs> I got to, I got through high school and then I, I kind of took it to the next level in college. I did well in college. And you went to uh, you went to the Ohio State, right? I don't. 
Be quiet. I went to uh, the Bowling Green State. Oh, the Bowling Green. I thought you went to the Ohio State because Kess no. went to Michigan, right? No, Kess went to Ohio State. Oh, anybody, that's right. Anybody can get in there. Uh, <laughs> they got uh, 76,000 people that go there, so how, how difficult can it be to get in? <laughs> so, no, I went to a little bit smaller, a little uh, smarter school. Bowling Green. Mike Johnson went there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Mike Johnson. Yeah, he's a TSN guy, isn't he? Yeah, I, I like yeah. how you, I like how you said it. Yeah, I know. Uh, no, I'm just giving him a hard time. He's a he's an intelligent guy. Um, Bowling Green, and then you guys would play like Canadian like universities like Western and McGill or whatever, and just wipe the floor with them, right? Uh, yeah, we do well against them. Uh, Windsor because they were close. Windsor, but, uh, okay. Who who even knew Windsor at a university? <laughs> uh, we, they got a they got a casino. You meet Zach Cassian, and you don't think that Windsor has a university, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we meet some of those, those teams. Uh, those are some, some good uh, warm-up games for us. Hey, who's more honest, you or your coach? Uh, oh, you know, that's pretty close. He's a straight shooter. He's so are you. Is. I try to be, yeah. No, you I, always are. I, I, I don't think you – I don't know if I've, I've met a more honest athlete. Like you're not, a, and you never say anything stupid, but you are always honest. I had a friend in the media today actually say to me, "He's uh, you're you're very honest with the media, and even when you're you're trying to lie, you're still honest." <laughs> that's, that's what my friend was saying. But like, oh, yeah, you're, you're right. I am. Even when I am trying to throw a joke around, it usually comes from some sort of truth. There's a line in Scarface where uh, Tony Montana says, "I always tell I always tell the truth, even when I lie." Yeah. He's, uh, that's a good movie. So that's wait, but you didn't answer the question. You, you said it was close between you and Tortorella. <clears throat> well, I don't know. We were two honest guys. Like, who tells the truth more? Who knows? I don't know. He, he tells the truth. He tells it like it is uh, in the dress room to the media, and you got to admire that. So if I can be compared to him, that's good. Do, are there any guys that are passive-aggressive on your team? Like that will not have will just avoid confrontation. Obviously, in your game, you have to have confrontation on the ice, but like off the ice or like. Yeah, there's a lot of guys, a lot of guys like that. I know you think that everyone's an alpha male, but uh, you know, off the ice, there's there's a lot of guys that are very passive and kind of like to blend in their surroundings. Don't like to be the center of attention. Like who? Alex Edler is the first guy that comes to mind. Really? Really nice, quiet, humble guy. Uh, your buddy Garrison too. Right, right, right. Yeah, he's a he's a pretty pretty good guy. He likes to blend in, doesn't like to be center of attention. So there's there's two great examples for you right there. So uh, so thank you for those. Um, in this piece that's coming out on on Friday, on Sports Center, I did a bit uh, where I asked five different NHL dudes, your boy Kessler included, about. How often do you say to your teammates, do you tell your teammates that you love them? Like, how often do you say to a dude, like, I love you, man, just like the movie? Do I tell my teammates that I love them individually? Yeah. Not like as a group, oh, I love you guys. Like an individual dude, like, like it's, if, it's, if it's Edler, it's like, Alex, man, I love you, man. I might not use those words exactly, but I think I express uh, my affection you know, pretty often with the guys that I like. Yeah, but no, I'm saying, but like you, but I have to, the the words, the actual words. I love you, man. I love you, man. You know, I've told only a handful of times I've ever told a teammate that I actually love him. <laughs> so when I asked Kessler, he when I did say it, I really meant it too. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. Uh, but you are also very sarcastic, so I it would I would have to I'd have to read your body language to really know if it was if it was sincere or not. <laughs> I uh, so when I asked Kessler, he said he he said he does it. Well, jokingly, he said it does it about once a week. I'm like, well, who are the guys that you say I love you, man, too? And he goes, oh, well, my guys. And the first guy he mentioned was you. He's like, you know, Bieksa, yeah. Burroughs, Edler, uh, Garrison, like those. He's ta- oh, he's talking about in the shower. <laughs> okay. I remember, yeah, yeah, some yeah, once in a while. So uh, yeah, so those are those. So you didn't know that. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a. A little insight. Well, maybe, I, maybe I need to start telling guys that I love them more. It seems like I'm not doing enough. Well, how do you how do you think that would affect your street cred? My street cred? Yeah. My street cred is solid right now. I'm not worried about that. I'm just worrying about my teammates knowing how much I love them. 
Um, would you tell Would you tell the twins individually, or would you tell them as one because they're kind of like one one unit yeah. unit? I, I'd probably tell them together. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever get one of them on their own. It's usually, it's usually a package deal. <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. That's amazing. Hey, uh, so, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to keep you any in, that much longer because I know that um, you're about to rip through Homeland, which is a dope, a dope. Uh, have you um, have you started watching The Blacklist? No. I'm no, on The Blacklist. What else are you watching uh, other than Homeland, like on the regular? Uh, Game of Thrones is a, is a big one. That's, that's, that's the number one for me. But we're just, yeah, we're just waiting out for season four. Yeah, so. January can't come soon enough. It's like right around like any NFL playoffs. Like, give me some Game of Thrones. Yeah. Game of Thrones is, I can't wait for that one. So, uh, those are the main two. Um, uh, can't think of what else that we're going through right now. Breaking Bad, we're, we're close to starting that one. We haven't even got into that yet. Me neither. So you're going to start from ground, like the ground floor, like season one, episode one? See, we have season one right now on uh, in the batter's box. So, <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's queued up, ready to go. Do you watch Eastbound and Down? No. Uh, do you watch uh, Boardwalk Empire? No. Hostages we're also thinking about getting into. Hostages. Okay, that's a new one, right? That's new this yeah. season? Yeah. How it's, I don't know. What do you hear about that? Uh, I haven't heard anything about that one yet. Um, what about, uh, do you watch like some of the mainstays like Modern Family? A little bit, but not uh, not religiously. What else is out there? Dexter? Were you on Dexter? No. Walking Dead? I got two kids. Like I'm not just watching TV all night. Like I got I got stuff going on, you know. No, I know, but the, but the nighttime or when you're on the plane, dude, you're away for six months of the year. I play cards every single time, and from takeoff to landing. Oh, so you're not even crushing out episodes on your iPad? No, no, no. I'm trying to put food on the table. I'm trying to make some money. <laughs> Well, I'm That's sure. A bad, bad start to the year too. Yeah, for you? For me, yeah. Why have you have you not scored a goal yet? No, no, on the plane, cards. I thought we we're talking cards. Oh, I th yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Sorry, a bad start. So you're in the hole, is what you're saying? Yeah, like my kids can't even eat right now. Oh boy, you're down about what four or five, uh, four or five bands, four or five stacks. Forty, fifty bucks. Yeah. No, not forty, fifty bucks. <laughs> You guys, you guys play with different rules, okay? Everything we is play, is multiplied by like, 100 for you guys. No, we don't play for the, the big stakes at our own things we do. We get some pretty, like I said, we get some pretty cheap guys on our team, so we keep it very uh, respectable. Charles Barkley once said that he lost, when, when he was asked on the Dan Lebertard show, what's the most he lost to Michael Jordan? He said 70 Gs when they played in Charlie. Barcelona. This is in 1992. It's the Summer Olympics, the Dream Team. They're in Barcelona, Spain, and they play cards from from dusk till dawn um, in uh, either Magic's room or Larry's room or Michael's room. It was Charles, Michael. Yeah, imagine losing a million in cards to uh, Michael no. I can't even, I, I lost, I, and this is just me, just the blue call. I lost uh, 1,100 once playing poker, and I've, I've never played poker since. You're not, yeah, but you're not blue collar anymore. You used to be blue collar. This is when I was blue collar, doggy. This is when no, I was just starting out. No, you're blue chip now. Like, you're Whatever. Big dog. Whatever. Big dog. Kevin, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your friendship. Yes. Well, what a, what a conversation we just had. <laughs> Dude, I, I think people, I think people are into it. They, you no, know. I don't, who, I don't know who's going to listen to this, but it was it was fun to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. As they say in TV, we'll let the audience decide. Um, I hope um, I hope you climb yourself out of that little hole that you're in, a la team playing and and poker playing. And um, well, I hope that uh, this year on the West Coast, you guys bring the pain. Do what you came to do, number three. We'll see. We'll do our best here. Hey, um. Yeah. Every when when Game of Thrones uh, starts up again, we'll have like uh, you might get a text where I ruin it for you. Let's, let's Skype. Let's Skype in the first uh, <laughs> episode. Let, uh, I like that idea. I'm fully going to do it. After this, I'm going to text you my email address. I'm like, yeah, man, let's just be Skype buddies. I don't know if it's weird cool. for two grown men to be Skype buddies. Probably, but whatever. We'll make it. We'll make it work, though. We're game changers. Uh, thank you for very much, man, and uh, I'll catch up with you soon. All right, pal. Thanks. Appreciate okay. that. Thank you for listening to Cabby Presents the podcast.